You will hear some sentences. You will hear each sentence twice. Choose the best reply to each sentence. Number one. Number one. Your new bag's better than mine. Your new bag's better than mine. Number two. Number two. When's the party? When's the party? Number three. Number three. Oh, I just can't understand this homework. Oh, I just can't understand this homework. Number four. Number four. May I speak to Mr. Smith? May I speak to Mr. Smith? Number five. Number five. You've got a new job. Well done. You've got a new job. Well done. Number six. Number six. Uh, what did he say? Uh, what did he say? Number seven. Number seven. What does Peter look like? What does Peter look like? That is the end. You have twenty seconds. You will hear a radio presenter called William talking about a photography course he did. I had a great time away on holiday, and one of the things I did was go on a two-day photography course about taking photos of people. It was for beginners, and I was given quite a few tips, some of which I think are really useful. For example, getting your position correct is really important. They said a common mistake is to stand too far away from the person. You get a much better result if you get close to them. As they take up more of the photo, it's also important to make sure the camera is at the same height as the person, especially if you're taking one of a child. A really useful tip was to pay attention to the background. The person will stand out much more if the background is as plain as possible. This will help you to focus on the subject of your photo. Although most smartphones come with a flash to provide extra light, they suggested we try to make as much use as possible of daylight. Doing this will make the colours more accurate, 
and the photo will appear more natural. We're all used to asking someone to say cheese when we're about to take their photo. To get a more interesting picture, they recommended taking a photo of the person when they don't know you're about to do it. Perhaps they're reading or looking out of the window. Finally, they told us to take plenty of photos so we can practice our skills. They said we should aim to take at least three photos of people every day. These can be of friends and family, or even strangers, if you ask their permission. Now listen again. I had a great time away on holiday, and one of the things I did was go on a two-day photography course about taking photos of people. It was for beginners, and I was given quite a few tips, some of which I think are really useful. For example, getting your position correct is really important. They said a common mistake is to stand too far away from the person. You get a much better result if you get close to them, as they take up more of the photo. It's also important to make sure the camera is at the same height as the person, especially if you're taking one of a child. A really useful tip was to pay attention to the background. The person will stand out much more if the background is as plain as possible. This will help you to focus on the subject of your photo. Although most smartphones come with a flash to provide extra light, they suggested we try to make as much use as possible of daylight. Doing this will make the colours more accurate and the photo will appear more natural. We're all used to asking someone to say cheese when we're about to take their photo. To get a more interesting picture, they recommended taking a photo of the person when they don't know you're about to do it. Perhaps they're reading or looking out of the window. Finally, they told us to take plenty of photos so we can practice our skills. They said we should aim to take at least three photos of people every day. These can be of friends and family, or even strangers, if you ask their permission. That is the end. Use the letters only once. There are three extra letters which you do not need to use. You now have 30 seconds in which to look through part three. Speaker 1 You'd be surprised how affectionate they can be, especially at night when you see them all cuddled up together. Makes me wonder how some people can hate them so much. And they're really playful too sometimes. Of course you can't have them running around the house all the time, but we try to give them as much freedom as possible. Although we do have to keep them out of sight when Trevor's mother comes round, if she catches sight of just one of them, she starts yelling and screaming. Speaker 2 We'd been trying for years to get the stupid thing to talk, you know, tempting him with biscuits and saying his name over and over again, but he didn't utter a word. He squawked every so often, so in the end we kind of gave up hope of ever hearing him speak. And then he goes and comes out with a rude word right in front of the vicar, who was having tea in our living room at the time. I don't know where he could have heard that word before. It certainly wasn't from me. Mind you, the vicar did take it very well, 
but I suppose he must have heard language like that in the past from other parishioners. Speaker 3 Morris is so intelligent. I'm certain he recognises his name, which I'm told is quite unusual when you get them after they've grown up. He certainly knows he's on to a good thing with us, but I guess it couldn't really be much worse than what he was used to before. I mean, the people at the shelter for stray animals must have their hearts in the right place, but putting an animal like that in such a small cage, it's inhuman. You should have heard the yapping and barking coming from those cages. My Tony's more soft-hearted than I am. He wanted to take them all home. Speaker 4 Well, at first I wouldn't have it in the house, but Matthew pleaded with me for a whole afternoon and in the end I gave in. And now I've grown to be quite fond of Ferdinand. He's not a bit like you'd imagine. I mean, he's ever so clean and doesn't take that much looking after. And if you were brave enough to hold him, he's actually quite soft and furry and really quite warm. Anyway, he's Matthew's responsibility and that's what matters. The only thing I don't like so much is this horrible clicking noise he makes with his mouth while he's eating. Speaker 5 I really don't think I'd ever be interested in any other kind of pet. After all, we've had a dog and a cat in the past, but it wasn't the same thing at all. I suppose it's the variety that interests me. I mean, there are so many different colours and patterns and shapes and sizes, and they all move in different ways as well. I can spend hours in front of the tank, watching them going up and down and from side to side. And this next week's going to be really interesting, because one of them has laid some eggs, and according to my reference book, they should be hatching any day now. You will hear the piece again. Speaker 1 You'd be surprised how affectionate they can be, especially at night when you see them all cuddled up together. Makes me wonder how some people can hate them so much. And they're really playful too sometimes. Of course you can't have them running around the house all the time, but we try to give them as much freedom as possible although we do have to keep them out of sight when Trevor's mother comes round. If she catches sight of just one of them, she starts yelling and screaming. Speaker 2 We'd been trying for years to get the stupid thing to talk, you know, tempting him with biscuits and saying his name over and over again, but he didn't utter a word. He squawked every so often, so in the end we kind of gave up hope of ever hearing him speak. And then he goes and comes out with a rude word right in front of the vicar, who was having tea in our living room at the time. I don't know where he could have heard that word before. It certainly wasn't from me. Mind you, the vicar did take it very well, but I suppose he must have heard language like that in the past from other parishioners. Speaker 3 Morris is so intelligent. I'm certain he recognises his name, which I'm told is quite unusual when you get them after they've grown up. He certainly knows he's on to a good thing with us, but I guess it couldn't really be much worse than what he was used to before. I mean, the people at the shelter for stray animals must have their hearts in the right place, but putting an animal like that in such a small cage, it's inhuman. You should have heard the yapping and barking coming from those cages. 
my Tony's more soft-hearted than I am. He wanted to take them all home. Speaker 4 well, at first I wouldn't have it in the house, but Matthew pleaded with me for a whole afternoon and in the end I gave in. And now I've grown to be quite fond of Ferdinand. He's not a bit like you'd imagine. I mean, he's ever so clean and doesn't take that much looking after and if you were brave enough to hold him, he's actually quite soft and furry and really quite warm. Anyway, he's Matthew's responsibility and that's what matters. The only thing I don't like so much is this horrible clicking noise he makes with his mouth while he's eating. Speaker 5 I really don't think I'd ever be interested in any other kind of pet. After all, we've had a dog and a cat in the past, but it wasn't the same thing at all. I suppose it's the variety that interests me. I mean, there are so many different colours and patterns and shapes and sizes, and they all move in different ways as well. I can spend hours in front of the tank, watching them going up and down and from side to side, and this next week's going to be really interesting, because one of them has laid some eggs, and according to my reference book, they should be hatching any day now. That is the end of part three. So I have a couple of ideas about where we can eat lunch after church. There are a number of good places in town, but we should find a place where a lot of people can eat and they have a children's play area. Most people go to Ella's Deli, right across the street, but I think we should also consider going to the Olive Garden. That's just up the street to the right of the church to the first intersection. It's on the opposite corner. I love that place and it's next to a park as well. And then there's Maurice's. It's a little bit more expensive, but I actually like the kids' area they have the best. It's on the same block as the Olive Garden, just on the other side of the park. I actually prefer Maurice's. But we might have some students with us too, so a much more affordable place that could accommodate us all would be the town and grill, back down past the Harford shopping mall from Maurice's. You have to go left on King Street just a bit, and it's on your right. It's next to Tom's but Tom's doesn't have a children's play area. You will hear the piece again. So I have a couple of ideas about where we can eat lunch after church. There are a number of good places in town, but we should find a place where a lot of people can eat and they have a children's play area. Most people go to Ella's Deli, right across the street, but I think we should also consider going to the Olive Garden. That's just up the street to the right of the church to the first intersection. It's on the opposite corner. I love that place and it's next to a park as well. And then there's Maurice's. It's a little bit more expensive, but I actually like the kids' area they have the best. It's on the same block as the Olive Garden, just on the other side of the park. I actually prefer Maurice's. But we might have some students with us too, so a much more affordable place that could accommodate us all would be the town and grill, back down past the Harford shopping mall from Maurice's. You have to go left on King Street just a bit, and it's on your right. It's next to Tom's but Tom's doesn't have a children's play area. Extract 1 You hear part of a radio interview with a product designer called Charles Lachlan. Now look at questions 1 and 2.
Charles, you're retired now, but you actually designed some 600 household products, and all of them as an employee of a company. Did it ever frustrate you that you were making products without your name on? It was standard practice. Besides, I needed a weekly paycheck before I needed recognition. Nowadays, you can find designers' names on products, but it tends to be high-profile people seeking attention. And then there's celebrity endorsement and all that. People think that if they buy a soccer ball that has the name of some famous player on it, they're going to score wonderful goals, a ploy to get you to buy products. <laughs> what advice do you have for young designers? <sighs> what they do will affect so many people during the lifetime of that product. That's serious stuff. So the product should do what it's supposed to do and be pleasing to have in your environment. I try to make things appear as if they just belong. They don't need to scream. I don't think a nutcracker needs to look like an elephant. Charles, you're retired now, but you actually designed some 600 household products, and all of them as an employee of a company. Did it ever frustrate you that you were making products without your name on? It was standard practice. Besides, I needed a weekly paycheck before I needed recognition. Nowadays, you can find designers' names on products, but it tends to be high-profile people seeking attention. And then there's celebrity endorsement and all that. People think that if they buy a soccer ball that has the name of some famous player on it, they're going to score wonderful goals, a ploy to get you to buy products. <laughs> what advice do you have for young designers? <sighs> what they do will affect so many people during the lifetime of that product. That's serious stuff. So the product should do what it's supposed to do and be pleasing to have in your environment. I try to make things appear as if they just belong. They don't need to scream. I don't think a nutcracker needs to look like an elephant. Extract 2 You hear two friends discussing a TV interview with an actress called Celia Dent. Now look at questions 3 and four. Well, what a one-sided interview that was, and with one of my favourite actresses. She hardly got a look in. No one would have learned anything new about her, especially as it was the usual tired stuff being put to her. When she did try to steer things in a different direction, the interviewer just ignored her and kept going on about himself. Mm, there aren't many really good interviewers, are there? The best ones really take on board what's being said and follow it up. This guy showed no imagination at all, just covering old ground and targeting obvious stuff. No wonder he couldn't get interesting responses. And Celia could have told a few stories. She's had a fascinating life. I know some film actors are perhaps a bit tricky. Some seem afraid to be themselves, like they're desperate to keep up their public image at all costs. And of course, many actors are interviewed just after their last film's been released and are understandably keen to publicise it. But interviewers often concentrate on other superficial stuff. I love it when actors are challenged a bit and the interviewer dares to deviate from the set script, putting them on the spot. Well, what a one-sided interview that was, and with one of my favourite actresses. She hardly got a look in. No one would have learned anything new about her, especially as it was the usual tired stuff being put to her. When she did try to steer things in a different direction, the interviewer just ignored her and kept going on about himself. Mm, there aren't many really good interviewers, are there? The best ones really take on board what's being said and follow it up. This guy showed no imagination at all, just covering old ground and targeting obvious stuff. No wonder he couldn't get interesting responses. And Celia could have told a few stories. She's had a fascinating life. I know some film actors are perhaps a bit tricky, some seem afraid to be themselves, like they're desperate to keep up their public image at all costs. And of course, many actors are interviewed just after their last film's been released and are understandably keen to publicise it. But interviewers often concentrate on other superficial stuff. I love it when actors are challenged a bit and the interviewer dares to deviate from the set script, putting them on the spot. Extract 3 
You hear two freelance journalists talking about their work. Now look at questions five and six. Hmm. I must get down to some work. Is getting started tricky for you? Well, it can take me a while to enter into a creative state, but once I'm there, I lose awareness of absolutely anything but the ideas flowing. Don't even perceive my fingers typing. Really? Hmm. And I'm then extremely resistant to interruptions, so I'll shout at anyone who knocks at my study door. My defensive reactions are subconscious, though, and usually I don't even recall them. The family's used to it, and I'm certainly not upholding it as a model of good behavior. But sometimes it's necessary. Yeah, once I'm immersed in creating something, I usually maintain that state until I complete the work,、mm. and I don't even feel as if I'm working. But if I look at the task ahead of me, all I tend to see is the effort involved. Right. And what about stuff you wrote ages back? Do you return to it for inspiration? Well, I find I can't always recreate the mindset I had during its creation because inevitably I've since broadened my perspective on it. I can see why I use the inspiration I did, but obviously experience changes you. Yes, absolutely. Hmm. I must get down to some work. Is getting started tricky for you? Well, it can take me a while to enter into a creative state, but once I'm there, I lose awareness of absolutely anything but the ideas flowing. Don't even perceive my fingers typing. Really? Hmm. And I'm then extremely resistant to interruptions, so I'll shout at anyone who knocks at my study door. My defensive reactions are subconscious, though, and usually I don't even recall them. The family's used to it, and I'm certainly not upholding it as a model of good behavior. But sometimes it's necessary. Yeah, once I'm immersed in creating something, I usually maintain that state until I complete the work,、mm. and I don't even feel as if I'm working. But if I look at the task ahead of me, all I tend to see is the effort involved. Right. And what about stuff you wrote ages back? Do you return to it for inspiration? Well, I find I can't always recreate the mindset I had during its creation because inevitably I've since broadened my perspective on it. I can see why I use the inspiration I did, but obviously experience changes you. Yes, absolutely. That's the end. Complete the sentences with a word. Or short phrase. You now have forty-five seconds to look at part two. Hello, everyone. My name is Janine Rogers, and I've got what many people would regard as a dream job. I'm a chocolate taster. My route into the job came after graduation. As a qualified chemist, I was looking to specialise as a lab technician. But when nothing came up, I considered retraining as a chef. Then I spotted a vacancy in the company I'm in now, and that's where my career started. Everyone has a very specific professional title. Mine being product developer. It doesn't cover everything I do, but it perfectly describes one aspect of the role. My background has been a real asset to my work here. I'm currently creating the perfect fillings for our chocolates. At the moment, it's caramel. But last month, I had to come up with a way of introducing bubbles into the chocolate mixture. It may sound trivial, but it's what sells the chocolate. 
and I suspect only someone with my technical knowledge would have had the know-how to pull that off. It may sound wonderful to work with chocolate all day, but it's not exactly a simple substance to work with. I'd even go so far as to call it problematic. That's because we're using a blend of fat as well as cocoa, which means the approaches we use and the time we spend blending it can be crucial. A lot of variables can affect how chocolate tastes. It doesn't naturally occur as the sweet-tasting confection we're all familiar with. Things like the climate of the region where the beans are grown have an effect, as does the technique used for drying them and the amount of sugar we put in the chocolate. I spend about 20% of my time actually tasting chocolate, but of course the end result is all the work of a team. For example, the marketing team will come up with a concept for a new range, and it's my job in research and development to bring that idea to life. Then we'll make samples and test them on consumers. After that, we'll speak to the engineers in manufacturing and also the people in charge of packaging, which, believe it or not, is an essential early stage. There's no point in creating something that can't be wrapped up and sold. Liquid chocolate is a good example. It's delicious, but difficult to preserve in that state for sale. We also rely heavily on advice from our legal team about the claims we make for our chocolate in our advertising, and we need to be aware whether we're making something that's not suitable for vegetarians, say, but we haven't stated this in our labelling. So what qualities are required in my job? Well, a curiosity about how things work and why. But above and beyond all else, you need initiative and lots of it. There'll be times when no one's giving you specific instructions and you need to get on by yourself. And, of course, you need to love chocolate. Now you'll hear part two again.